Uh, we will hopefully at least get into lesson three, but I'm not going to start the outline on it. So we ended up uh, on C, the command of the king, and we're talking about uh, the decision that Ahasuerus made to uh, take the kingdom or the queenhood or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, he disposed Vashti from being queen. And we'll read ver Esther verses, or chapter 1, verses 16 through 22. <clears throat> and maybe can answer before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and all, to all the people that are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes, when it shall be reported, the king, the king Hazarus commanded Vashti, the queen, to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it not be altered, that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husband's honor, both to great and small. And the same pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mebucon, for he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Uh, so this meeting that he called his counselors together was really a, a useless meeting because all they did was say what, what he wanted to hear. Uh, he could have done it with or without them. Uh, of course, we talked about that he had seven counselors which were there, uh, had the right to approach the throne, and uh, they basically uh, made all the decisions together. And they knew how to flatter the king. And, of course, you can, in the reading of that, you see how they pit, lifted him up and put down Vashti. Uh, but they had foolish advice given out of selfish motives and encourage the king to make this command. Uh, number, first of all, we want to talk about this command being a, a vindictive command. Vashti actually made a wise decision because she knew uh, it wasn't just, as we said, it wasn't just to come before the people, but to actually to show her body to the people, uh, to the leaders that were there on that seven-day uh, feast, uh, drunken feast, basically. And so she made a wise decision, but they, of course, punished her for that. Uh, the command was rooted in a hazardous desire for revenge. She didn't do what he said, so he was going to get back at her. And a lot of times, even Christians do that very thing. We might not go to this length of something, uh, but a lot of times we say and do things because somebody else said or done something to us. That's not the way that we're supposed to behave. The vindictive, punitive command against Vashti was all done to cover up for a king. He had actually been the one to make the mistake. He was the one that made a rash uh, demand. He was drunk. He acted inappropriately, and now he wanted to save face. It's sort of like making a law after somebody does something and then punish them for it, although there was no law to start with. <clears throat> but not only punished Vashti, but it also punished all the women of the 127 provinces uh, that he ruled over. And it also punished the person that would be considered as the next queen. Because it, it wasn't that, do you want to be queen? No, you go out and pick these women, and I'll make the one queen that I want to be, want to be queen. 
But we know that throughout history, ungodly leaders, I just made this thing jump. Ungodly leaders put into powerful positions. It's the same way today. Uh, it, wouldn't it be great if our leaders were godly? It would be a totally different world that we live in today. But we know for the most part they're completely ungodly and, and very, very few are actually what you consider godly. So when you think about it, one of the big uh, questions in the election today is about abortion. Well, how did abortion get passed back in the 1970s by a bunch of ungodly leaders? And it was ungodly men, not ungodly women. There might have been a woman involved in the, uh, the center point of it, but it was men that made the decision. And let's be honest, we're not going to get any details, but think about the advantage that that gave men. Without the Bible as their moral compass, these leaders that we had today, the leaders in the book of Esther, made unreasonable choices that affect nations. And we have that today. We have things that affect us. We can't do what we really want to do. We are forced to pay things we don't want to pay because of ungodly decisions. So we talked about the realm of Persian power, the revelation of a wicked ruler, and the reasoning of ungodly men, but we know that God is still on the throne. Now in this last section of Lesson 2, let's notice how God intervenes even when men make foolish decisions. I'm, I'm certain if you've been saved for a length of time, there's been times in your life where you've been come up against something, you see absolutely no way that you can do the Christian thing and everything come out right. And you can't make it come out right, but God can make it come out right. So number four, the ruling hand of God. The ruling hand of God. Have you ever heard uh, people around you ask, well, where's God anyway? Does he see what's happening? Is he ever going to do something about it? I've heard these statements made by many people, even Christians, and maybe you've allowed yourself to get to the point where you have asked the question yourself in the past. But no matter how dark the world may be, God is aware of everything that is happening. Nothing is taking God by surprise. These questions are a very common excuse people use for not getting saved. If God let this happen, I don't want anything to do with him. I've heard people say that because they didn't like what happened and they, they blame it on God. We don't need to blame things. Yes, God does know what happened, but it's not his fault that it happened. He is working things out for our good. When you say, I don't understand why God did this, he should have done this, you are assuming that you know more than God does. God sees a much bigger picture than we do or we could ever understand even when we don't understand we can rest in the knowledge that God is in control we have to believe that and A the perception of man so we see things happen and we don't understand it and we, we perceive what we think to be the causes what we, what we think to be the results what we think to be uh, the people that caused it. So we have a perception of things that go on around us in life. Sometimes in the hurt and the confusion, uh, we think, well, the, well, there's no use in continuing to being good. The wicked is, is always going to win. And I'm not moving the thing, am I? There we go. The perception of man. But that thought is untrue. Simple choices lead to tragic destinations. And in the end, God always wins. When we make simple choices, there's bad going to happen. And people all over the world make simple choices, so bad things are going to happen. Proverbs 16, 25 
There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There are people, it's almost an infinite number of ways that people think you can get to heaven. But there's only one way to heaven. And it's the perception of man that comes up with all these ways that they think they can get to heaven. But the Bible says the end thereof are the ways of death. We don't need to go our own way. Many times when we've gone our own way, that's what we've done right before we said, we think, well, why did God let this happen? He didn't let it happen. We're not where we're supposed to be. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We, we put ourselves in the position. So that's the perception of man, but now let's talk about the providence of God. Not only is God's providence hard to perceive before he carries it out, sometimes it's hard to believe after he carries it out. King Ahasuerus, uh, we see the, a story like this carrying on today. Tragedies happen today. Uh, but we know that God is at work. The whole time that throughout the book of Esther, God is working toward elevating a young Jewish girl to save Israel. Anywhere in the world where the Bible is allowed to be taught, people know that one day God separated the Red Sea to save his children. Now, we see that as a, a great miracle. Anybody that believes it knows it, sees it as a great miracle. Well, that's not the only time that God saved his people. He saved them here in the book of Esther. He didn't part the seas, but he used one young Jewish woman to save an estimated 750,000 Jews. Just as much a miracle as parting the Red Sea. God could have done it any way that he wanted to, but this is the way that he did it. Despite all the foolishness of a Ahasuerus, God brought this Jewish girl in to do what he wanted done. God can use, what, again, can use it whatever means he desires to, to come up to accomplish what he wants desired, and he can use whomever he wants to use. We can't always understand how God is working, but we can't always know that he is at work. God is always at work for us. Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Now let's face it. We go through life and things happen or situations come up. We face circumstances and we think, well, the best way to work this out is if this happens. Well, it might work that way. But it might not work that way at all. But we have to realize our perception is not God's providence. And that's what we should desire instead of our perception. Instead of praying, God, work this out like this, we should always pray, God, work this out to your will. Lord, I, I believe it. I trust in your providence. Sometimes we think everything happening around us is only evil. And God is, but God is always doing something behind the scenes. Perhaps you've had an unreasonable boss, unjust judge, or ungodly political leader. Has any of y'all got an ungodly political leader in your life? <laughs> uh, and you know, you have to deal with the circumstances of it. Christians have to deal with the circumstances of ungodly uh, leaders. And we're going through oppressive situation but we have to know that God is with us he has a purpose just as God placed Esther in Persia now we can look at this and we see and we know uh, we can read the scriptures that this is why she was there this is what she did we it's it's absolutely easy for a Christian to look and read this and believe and understand that God used Esther to save the Jews if you've been saved any length of time and you've, if you've read this chapter and studied the Word of God just a little bit, 
That's easy to understand. But here's what gets a little harder for us to understand. He has placed you. He has placed me where we are for the time that he has prepared for us. He, didn't, he's not more, he wasn't more concerned with Esther than he's concerned with me or you. He's just as concerned with us as he was Esther. He didn't make a, a special case out of Esther for Esther. He made a special case out of Esther for the Jews, for, the whole, for, his, uh, his, for his, all his people. And that is what we are to understand that he is placing us and using us for the very same thing. Now, it, probably not going to be said that Eddie Smith, God's using you, and God used Eddie Smith and saved every Christian in America. It may be, Brother Eddie, but it probably won't be. But if we live and trust in God's providence, we all have a part in the salvation of Christians. No matter what authorities you may deal with, he is always on the throne. Whatever situation you may be dealing with, God's got this. Is that clock right? No, that clock's not right. Okay. Yeah, I guess it is too. All right. Lesson three. We're just going to do an overview of lesson three this morning. Uh, so we're not going to hand out the outlines. Uh, the title is uh, The Unseen Director. And a verse uh, to sort of throw us in the direction of the lesson is Psalm 75, 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. And we just have to trust in his providence that that's what's happening. I know we got an election coming up in 2020. We probably thought, well, God providential placed the president there. I mean, 2016 placed the president. Then 2020 come along, we said, well, what happened, God? God's still in control. And in this election, come the day after, well, probably be about February, it's January 5th, probably. Maybe we'll know who won the election. But God's in control. God's in control. Sometimes we look around, we, again, we doubt God's presence, but he's there. It's just like the director of a play in the background. Uh, you see uh, is, he's unseen by the audience, uh, but he is, he is at work directing the play. Well, God is always present, even if we can't see exactly what he's doing. In Esther 2, we see God, the unseen director of the story or drama. Now, let me be clear. When I say that this is a drama, let me give you my definitions of drama. An exciting, emotional, or unexpected series of true events or set of circumstances. So I'm not talking about a made-up play or made-up story. This is a drama of a true story. This is actually what happened and God was directing the whole thing. We are reminded that just as he had not forgotten all the Jews in Shusan, he's not forgotten us either. The goals of this lesson will be be encouraged by understanding God is present even when we don't see him, when we don't feel him, when we have no idea what's going on. Understand that at times God works in ways that we don't understand. And rest in the sovereignty of God who oversees the affairs of men. So how do you know that you believe in the sovereignty of God? When you rest in the sovereignty of God. If you're unsettled about what's going on, you're not resting in his sovereignty and you're not fully convinced of it. But when you absolutely believe it, you can rest in it. We'll have three points in this lesson. A defeated king, a promoted orphan, and a prominent Jew. And we'll save these verses, I think, for next week. 
We'll read verse 17 of chapter 2. Is that right? Yeah, chapter 2, verse 17. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, we need to be careful when we read this verse that we, we're understanding all the words in the verse. We don't need to misunderstand the words, the king loved Esther. Now, if you just take that at face value, oh, they brought all these women in, and the king found one that he just loved. That's not what the verse says. We have to take account the next four words. So we'll read those four words again. The king loved Esther above all the women. We could also say this. The king loved all the women, but he loved Esther the most. You see the difference? He didn't love one woman. He loved them all. So we, we understand this is certainly not an agape love, right? It's a lust. We could assume that there were at least 100, was 127 provinces, 100, 127 provinces. So we can assume that there's at least 127 new virgins before the king. He's already got a harem. We talked about that already of women. And now they've brought in 127 more. And he loves them all. But he loves Esther the most. Now women, if you're here today and your hub, husband, I guess he proposed to you. Sometimes it goes the other way. But if he proposed to you and he said this, well, I've dated 127 women, and I love them all, but I love you the most. How many would have said it? yes? Hopefully none of you, right? I mean, but that's basically what he's saying. He says, you're the best. Now, I don't know how much by what degree, but you're the best out of all of them. That's, that's, that's what he's saying. Now, as a way of introduction into this lesson, uh, when you attend a drama, a play, radio or television, whatever, several aspects, you notice several aspects about the performance. You notice the actors, the sets, the props, the backdrops, but you don't really see the director. And again, we're talking about a drama, the true events of this time. And we see all the actors and players, and again, God's not mentioned in Esther. But we see him in the words all through Esther. He is in complete control of the book of Esther. The book of Esther, well, it's got a lot of complex characters, tragic conflict, intense climax, and a satisfying conclusion. And so we have all this, and we see all the people involved, but we have to remember that God is directing everything that happens. Again, it's the story of a young orphan girl who suddenly ascends to become the queen. And not just a queen, but the queen of the most powerful kingdom of that time and probably that there ever had been. We learned that ordinary days can become extraordinary. When we go through our, our daily routines, we need to remember God knows where you are. He can move you, change you, and use you in ways that you don't understand. We should plan our lives. We should have a, a plan in our lives of uh, certain things we have to plan for. Uh, but we also have to plan for God changing things in our lives. I remember something my cousin did when I was about eight years old. We were playing in a creek. It's a pretty good-sized creek. And uh, he flipped a big rock over. And I guess he had been studying geology or whatever in school. And he said, well, I've changed the course of the creek. And he had. Made no difference, really. But he changed the course of that creek. I don't, don't think it caused a tsunami anywhere down the, down the, uh, when it ran into the river or anything like that. But he had. Now, again, there's no significance to change in that. 
But that's the way God works in our lives sometimes. Although we see, feel, hear, and are immediately affected by some of the bigger influences that he places in our lives, there are many obstacles that he flips in our path or out of our path that basically we don't pay much attention to. But he is directing our lives even though we don't notice it. Most of which we see there's no significance at the time but he, he turns our paths just a little bit to get us in the direction that we need to be. Many times God slowly turns us in that right direction. Sometimes we feel like we run into a wall. That may be because we didn't pay attention to those little obstacles he was trying to put in our path. He was trying to say, kindly, slowly, gently tell us what direction to go in, and we don't listen, so then he just... He stops us. I remember when I was working for the state, I worked for the bridge department, and we come in to work this one morning, and the ambulance was there. Now, the main thing that we did, uh, we tore out old bridges, the old bridges with the wooden handrails that you hardly see of any in North Carolina anymore. There's very few of them left. We'd tear out those little bridges, and we'd put pipe in, and put your road back over top of it. Well, I was with the bridge department. We, we would tear them out, put the pipe in, and then another group would come in and put the road over top of it. So we come in one morning, the ambulance is there. Well, what's going on? A guy had run smack into the back of the crane, like, it wasn't even, like he didn't know anything. He, he lived somehow because he tried to sue the state later. He said there was no signs up. There were signs all up and down that road. Anytime we tore a bridge out, they, there was an overabundance of signs telling you road closed, road closed, road closed, road closed. But he didn't pay attention to them. We have to pay attention when God changes our course. God puts things in our lives. If we're not paying attention, if we're not living for him, if we're not doing what we know is right to do, if we're not praying, studying, reading, coming to church, you're not going to see them. You're, you're not going to see those things that God is trying to direct you in the right way. And he may have to put a wall in front of you to stop you. But God changed the course of Esther. He directed her steps. And she followed those steps as she had direction. And we also learned that burdens can become blessings. Many things that we have in our lives and we say, I don't want that. We need to remember if we're in God's will and he allowed it to happen, he's going to work it out. Many times we say, whew, I'm glad that happened. When it first happened, we said, oh, that's bad. <clears throat> God was directing her life the whole time when she could not see what he was doing. So imagine this. All right, 18-year-old Christian girl, right? Foreign power comes in to the United States, takes over. We'll just use a, a very common figure that we could understand. A Hitler-type figure comes in, right? And he takes control. And he decides he wants a new wife, and he chooses that 18-year-old Christian girl. That's bad. That's bad. But God can turn that around and use it for our good. As bad as something seems, God can turn it around and use it for our good. The story is made up of several cast members. In this lesson, we would, again, we would have focused on a defeated king, a promoted orphan, and a prominent Jew. And we'll pick up with number one there, a defeated king, next week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come to church again, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray, Lord, for those that come in on the bus this morning, Lord. I pray they hear the word. And, Lord, uh, if they're not saved, they'll be saved. And, Lord, we thank you for all the outreaches of the church, Lord, as we try to uh, witness for you. And, Lord, I pray for a soul to be saved today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.